Chapter 6 of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs, narrated by Gregicator. The Jealous Mistress I would ten thousand times rather that my children should be the half-starved paupers of Ireland than to be the most pampered among the slaves of America. I would rather drudge out my life on a cotton plantation till the grave opened to give me rest than to live with an unprincipled master and a jealous mistress. The felon's home in a penitentiary is preferable. He may repent and turn from the error of his ways and so find peace, but it is not so with a favorite slave. She is not allowed to have any pride of character. It is deemed a crime in her to wish to be virtuous. Mrs. Flint possessed the key to her husband's character before I was born. She might have used this knowledge to counsel and to screen the young and the innocent among her slaves, but for them she had no sympathy. They were the objects of her constant suspicion and malevolence. She watched her husband with unceasing vigilance, but he was well practiced in means to evade it. What he could not find opportunity to say in words, he manifested in signs. He invented more than were ever thought of in a deaf and dumb asylum. I let them pass, as if I did not understand what he meant, and many were the curses and threats bestowed on me for my stupidity. One day he caught me teaching myself to write. He frowned, as if he was not well pleased, but I suppose he came to the conclusion that such an accomplishment might help to advance his favorite scheme. Before long, notes were often slipped into my hand. I would return them, saying, I can't read them, sir. Can't you, he replied. Then I must read them to you. He always finished the reading by asking, Do you understand? Sometimes he would complain of the heat of the tea room and order his supper to be placed on a small table in the piazza. He would seat himself there with a well-satisfied smile and tell me to stand by and brush away the flies. He would eat very slowly, pausing between the mouthfuls. These intervals were employed in describing the happiness I was so foolishly throwing away and in threatening me with the penalty that finally awaited my stubborn disobedience. He boasted much of the forbearance he had exercised towards me and reminded me that there was a limit to his patience. When I succeeded in avoiding opportunities for him to talk to me at home, I was ordered to come to his office to do some errand. When there, I was obliged to stand and listen to such language as he saw fit to address to me. Sometimes I so openly expressed my contempt for him that he would become violently enraged, and I wondered why he did not strike me. Circumstanced as he was, he probably thought it was better policy to be forbearing. But the state of things grew worse and worse daily. In desperation, I told him that I must and would apply to my grandmother for protection. He threatened me with death, and worse than death, if I made any complaint to her. Strange to say, I did not despair. I was naturally of a buoyant disposition, and always I had a hope of somehow getting out of his clutches. Like many a poor, simple slave before me, I trusted that some threads of joy would yet be woven into my dark destiny. I had entered my sixteenth year, and every day it became more apparent that my presence was intolerable to Mrs. Flint. Angry words frequently passed between her and her husband. He had never punished me himself, and he would not allow anybody else to punish me. In that respect, she was never satisfied. But in her angry moods, no terms were too vile for her to bestow upon me. Yet I, whom she detested so bitterly, had far more pity for her than he had, whose duty it was to make her life happy. I never wronged her or wished to wrong her, and one word of kindness from her would have brought me to her feet. After repeated quarrels between the doctor and his wife, 
he announced his intention to take his youngest daughter, then four years old, to sleep in his apartment. It was necessary that a servant should sleep in the same room, to be on hand if the child stirred. I was selected for that office, and informed for what purpose that arrangement had been made. By managing to keep within sight of people as much as possible during the daytime, I had hitherto succeeded in eluding my master, though a razor was often held to my throat to force me to change this line of policy. At night I slept by the side of my great-aunt, where I felt safe. He was too prudent to come into her room. She was an old woman and had been in the family many years. Moreover, as a married man and a professional man, he deemed it necessary to save appearances in some degree. But he resolved to remove the obstacle in the way of his scheme, and he thought he had planned it so that he could evade suspicion. He was well aware how much I prized my refuge by the side of my old aunt, and he determined to dispossess me of it. The first night the doctor had the little child in his room alone, the next morning, I was ordered to take my station as a nurse the following night. A kind providence interposed in my favor. During the day, Mrs. Flint heard of this new arrangement, and a storm followed. I rejoiced to hear it rage. After a while, my mistress sent for me to come to her room. Her first question was, Did you know you were to sleep in the doctor's room? Yes, ma'am. Who told you? My master. Will you answer truly all the questions I ask? Yes, ma'am. Tell me, then, as you hope to be forgiven, are you innocent of what I have accused you? I am. She handed me a Bible and said, Lay your hand on your heart, kiss this holy book, and swear before God that you tell me the truth. I took the oath she required, and I did it with a clear conscience. You have taken God's holy word to testify your innocence, said she. If you have deceived me, beware. Now take this stool, sit down, look me directly in the face, and tell me all that has passed between your master and you. I did as she ordered. As I went on with my account, her color changed frequently. She wept and sometimes groaned. She spoke in tones so sad that I was touched by her grief. The tears came to my eyes, but I was soon convinced that her emotions arose from anger and wounded pride. She felt that her marriage vows were desecrated, her dignity insulted, but she had no compassion for the poor victim of her husband's perfidy. She pitied herself as a martyr, but she was incapable of feeling for the condition of shame and misery in which her unfortunate, helpless slave was placed." Yet perhaps she had some touch of feeling for me, for when the conference was ended, she spoke kindly and promised to protect me. I should have been much comforted by this assurance if I could have had confidence in it, but my experiences in slavery had filled me with distrust. She was not a very refined woman and had not much control over her passions. I was an object of her jealousy and, consequently, of her hatred, and I knew I could not expect kindness or confidence from her under the circumstances in which I was placed. I could not blame her. Slaveholders' wives feel as other women would under similar circumstances. The fire of her temper kindled from small sparks, and now the flame became so intense that the doctor was obliged to give up his intended arrangement. I knew I had ignited the torch, and I expected to suffer for it afterwards, but I felt too thankful to my mistress for the timely aid she rendered me to care much about that. She now took me to sleep in a room adjoining her own. There I was an object of her especial care, though not of her especial comfort, for she spent many a sleepless night to watch over me. Sometimes I woke up and found her bending over me. At other times, she whispered in my ear as though it was her husband who was speaking to me and listened to hear what I would answer. If she startled me on such occasions, she would glide stealthily away, and the next morning she would tell me I had been talking in my sleep and ask 
who I was talking to. At last I began to be fearful for my life. It had been often threatened, and you can imagine, better than I can describe, what an unpleasant sensation it must produce to wake up in the dead of night and find a jealous woman bending over you. Terrible as this experience was, I had fears that it would give place to one more terrible. My mistress grew weary of her vigils. They did not prove satisfactory. She changed her tactics. She now tried the trick of accusing my master of crime in my presence and gave my name as the author of the accusation. To my utter astonishment, he replied, I don't believe it, but if she did acknowledge it, you tortured her into exposing me. Tortured into exposing him? Truly, Satan had no difficulty in distinguishing the color of his soul. I understand his object in making this false representation. It was to show me that I gained nothing by seeking the protection of my mistress, that the power was still all in his own hands. I pitied Mrs. Flint. She was a second wife, many years the junior of her husband, and the hoary-headed miscreant was enough to try the patience of a wiser and better woman. She was completely foiled, and knew not how to proceed. She would gladly have had me flogged for my supposed false oath, but as I have already stated, the doctor never allowed anyone to whip me. The old sinner was politic. The application of the lash might have led to remarks that would have exposed him in the eyes of his children and grandchildren. How often did I rejoice that I lived in a town where all the inhabitants knew each other, if I had been on a remote plantation, or lost among the multitude of a crowded city, I should not be a living woman at this day. The secrets of slavery are concealed like those of the Inquisition. My master was, to my knowledge, the father of eleven slaves. But did the mothers dare to tell who was the father of their children? Did the other slaves dare to allude to it, except in whispers among themselves? No, indeed, they knew too well the terrible consequences. My grandmother could not avoid seeing things which excited her suspicions. She was uneasy about me and tried various ways to buy me, but the never-changing answer was always repeated. Linda does not belong to me. She is my daughter's property, and I have no legal right to sell her. The conscientious man, he was too scrupulous to sell me, but he had no scruples whatever about committing a much greater wrong against the helpless young girl placed under his guardianship as his daughter's property. Sometimes my persecutor would ask me whether I would like to be sold. I told him I would rather be sold to anybody than to lead such a life as I did. On such occasions he would assume the air of a very injured individual and reproach me for my ingratitude. Did I not take you into the house and make you the companion of my own children, he would say. Have I ever treated you like a negro? I have never allowed you to be punished, not even to please your mistress, and this is the recompense I get you, ungrateful girl. I answered that he had reasons of his own for screening me from punishment, and that the course he pursued made my mistress hate me and persecute me. If I wept, he would say, Poor child! Don't cry, don't cry. I will make peace for you with your mistress. Only let me arrange matters in my own way. Poor, foolish girl, you don't know what is for your own good. I would cherish you. I would make a lady of you. Now go and think of all I have promised you. I did think of it. Reader, I draw no imaginary pictures of southern homes. I am telling you the plain truth. Yet when victims make their escape from this wild beast of slavery, northerners consent to act the part of bloodhounds and hunt the poor fugitive back into his den, full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Nay, more, they are not only willing, but proud to give their daughters in marriage to slaveholders. The poor girls have romantic notions of a sunny clime and of the flowering vines that all the year round shade a happy home. To what disappointments are they destined? The young wife soon learns that the husband in whose hands she has placed her happiness 
pays no regard to his marriage vows. Children of every shade of complexion play with her own fair babies, and too well she knows that they are born unto him of his own household. Jealousy and hatred enter the flowery home, and it is ravaged of its loveliness. Southern women often marry a man, knowing that he is the father of many little slaves. They do not trouble themselves about it. They regard such children as property, as marketable as the pigs on the plantation, and it is seldom that they do not make them aware of this by passing them into the slave trader's hands as soon as possible, and thus getting them out of their sight. I am glad to say there are some honorable exceptions. I have myself known two southern wives who exhorted their husbands to free those slaves towards whom they stood in a parental relation, and their request was granted. These husbands blushed, before the superior nobleness of their wives' natures. Though they had only counseled them to do that which it was their duty to do, it commanded their respect and rendered their conduct more exemplary. Concealment was at an end, and confidence took the place of distrust. Though this bad institution deadens the moral sense, even in white women, to a fearful extent, it is not altogether extinct. I have heard southern ladies say of Mr. Such-a-one, He not only thinks it no disgrace to be the father of those little N-words, but he is not ashamed to call himself their master. I declare, such things ought not to be tolerated in any decent society.